All right, so I've got about 30 minutes, which is I think is going to be fine, but I might skip some slides in here. Um, but if you have questions about them, I'll come back to them later, just because I don't want to talk really fast and speed through what I think are the important parts. Um, we're going to be talking about retention time, IRT, and standards, which we've already kind of mentioned a couple times here. Um, but I just want to emphasize a couple definitions in case you might be new to mass spectrometry um, or maybe you work with the data but might not realize that uh, in front of the mass spectrometer sits a liquid chromatography uh, system. So the liquid chromatography, uh, all of our peptides or our small molecules that are dissolved in some solvent are separated out um, by liquid chromatography and the time at which they come off the column in front of the mass spectrometer is the retention time. Um, so I wanted to establish a couple of these definitions because that's what we're going to be talking about for the next 30 minutes. Um, there's three big reasons that you should be caring about your LC method and not just recycling whatever everyone in your lab uses. Uh, one is because liquid chromatography uh, should simplify your mixture to improve your signal to noise and every mixture is a little bit different so every mixture is going to require slightly different uh, tweaks to the chromatography method. Um, the second reason to care about this is the peak shape. Sue had mentioned that if you don't collect enough points across the peak, and I'll show you some pictures of this, if you don't collect enough points you just get a triangle. If you only collect one point that peak becomes a triangle, so accurately describing the shape of your peak affects um, your area under the curve. We'll be coming back to that too. And then finally, knowing something about a peptide's retention time helps us uh, tell the software, tell Skyline where to look for the peak. So if you have like an hour long gradient and Skyline saying, wow, you really want me to pour through an hour's worth of liquid chromatography to pick out your peak, you can help it a lot by saying, how about you just look in this five minute window right here? Um, so three big reasons uh, we should, as mass spectrometrists, be caring about the instrument in front of our instrument. Um, four main objectives for you here. There's going to be a lot of information, but these four take home points, as long as they're clear, you're golden. The first, I want to help you build an intuition for the effect that liquid chromatography has on your mass spec data. I want uh, to explore together how you can manipulate your liquid chromatography method if you're unfamiliar with the, that kind of method development. I'm going to explain to you a little bit more about how retention time is calculated based on just amino acid sequence or if you have empirical data. Um, and then finally, uh, we'll be doing this after lunch, so you don't have to worry about it yet. Um, we'll be building some familiarity with Skyline's retention time calculator, and I'll be showing you some tips and some screenshots here that you're more than welcome to open up one of the Skyline files on your flash drive and kind of play along with uh, changing between these views. So we're going to start off um, talking about uh, some of the trade-offs in liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. So what I have on the right, uh, the target list here, we're maybe a little bit more familiar with now. We've kind of poked around in uh, Skyline a little bit. That's the target list. And in the target list here, I'm showing you one peptide that we have a light endogenous, that's the 609, and a heavy synthetic uh, peptide. And all the transitions that I have already selected, refined, and optimized, um, how Sue was telling us before. The thing is, software, algorithmically, we can very accurately predict mass to charge based on just a peptide sequence, um, but we can't really predict retention time that well. Sue kind of showed you that a little bit with those regression lines and how kind of junky they looked. Um, so we can, in silico, predict mass to charge very well. We cannot, in silico, predict retention time very well. So Skyline uh, helps us visualize retention time in what's called a chromatogram. We've been looking a little bit at these. Sue was showing us a lot of spectra, but Skyline typically is used to view chromatograms. So I'm showing you here a chromatogram, so retention time on the x-axis and then intensity on the y-axis versus a spectrum, which is mass to charge on the x-axis and intensity on the y-axis. Same data, we just slice it a different way. Um, we could talk more about that later if there's any informaticians that are kind of curious about that. Showing you here all of the peptides that are in this Skyline document. You can visualize all of them by just selecting all of them and see how they're eluding over time. But let's talk about the, uh, the practical effects of chromatography. 
Um, let's say, for example, uh, I have some time increasing on the x-axis and some intensity on the y. And what I'm showing you with these straight vertical lines is let's imagine that my instrument takes a scan here, a scan here, a scan here, and a scan here. Each one of these scans has some intensity for the peptide. So here the peptide is very low intensity in this scan. It's kind of a middling intensity in the second scan, a higher intensity in the third scan. And this is actually what your instrument is seeing. So I kind of gave you a copy of this on the right so you can kind of either with a pen or just uh, on your computer, if you draw a line connecting all these points, you get the shape of the peak. But that's what Skyline's doing for you. It's interpolating between all these points to draw that chromatogram. But what's actually coming off your instrument is what looks like this. So let's imagine we had the exact same data, but we collected less scans. So we're actually collecting the exact same peak, but I have one less scan over the peak shape. We can't tell quite so well now where is the apex of this peak. Is it in between scan two and scan three, or maybe this is actually the apex and we have a tail on the end? Um, without enough scans, we can't accurately describe it. You can imagine this getting better or worse as I add more scans in between here. So let's take this as an example. Um, so I keep referring to kind of the spacing between these scans, but that actually has a word. It's called the cycle time. So if we imagine uh, a peak on the left and a peak on the right, um, these two uh, peptides would have different peak shapes, right? So the quantitative accuracy is affected by how many of these scans we can get as the peptide is eluding. Um, and like Sue was saying, we end up describing different shapes of peaks. So this is a figure showing you again a chromatogram, so time on the X and intensity on the Y. And it's showing you if we have some presumed ground truth peak in black with different scan rates and, and different uh, by manipulating the, the cycle time and the, the dwell time, we end up describing different shapes for what should be the exact same peak. So all of this is just kind of give you a little bit of an intuition, a feel for why liquid chromatography is so important for mass spectrometry data. So it kind of comes down to balancing three things. So your job, if you're developing methods, um, is to think about these three things. One is the target list. We just talked a lot about the target list. Um, the second is acquisition time, so just how long you're going to use to acquire the data. And the third is dwell time. So the target list is probably determined in part by the experiment. Your boss says, I want to measure 200 proteins, and you're like, yeah, probably not. Um, but however long or however short that list is, is one factor to consider. Second factor to consider is the acquisition time. In an academic lab and an academic background, Maybe it's not really something to worry about. If you want to take two hours to collect data, maybe that's totally fine and it's just up to uh, how much the instrument time costs. But if you're in a clinical setting, maybe you're limited to 15 minutes or 20 minutes total in between sample turnaround. Um, so that's another thing that you'll have to balance in your method. And finally, it's the dwell time. So that's the amount of time you're going to spend on each one of those scans. Longer dwell means you kind of get better, more intense data. Um, shorter dwell doesn't look quite as good. Um, balancing these three things all comes down to your, your choices as a method developer. Um, so one final note I want to make on this kind of little triangle that we'll keep revisiting is that the number of targets time the dwell, times uh, the dwell multiplied by the dwell time uh, is that cycle time in between scans that I was just talking about. So it can, it's all kind of coming back to the same concepts that I'll try to keep relating to this triangle of things to balance. Um, so to get more points, more scans on this hypothetical chromatogram that we're collecting, we could do two things. We could either increase the number of scans or make our peak broader, right? So two ways we can manipulate how many scans, either collect more of them and keep the peak the same or make the peak broader uh, and keep the number of scans the same. So this is the physical setup of your LC system. 
And I know a lot of people kind of feel more comfortable doing whatever, whatever everyone in their lab is doing. If everyone in your lab does a 20 centimeter column and has the liquid chromatography method that everybody recycles, um, I think that's usually the, the normal situation for a lot of labs. I know it was for mine before we started cracking down on that. Um, the three things about your column itself are the length, the, how long the column, um, usually you're packing this yourself, so maybe sometimes it's 20 centimeters and sometimes it's 25 and it kind of varies in between. What stationary phase, what material you're putting inside the column, and then finally how wide that column is. So I think a lot of labs fix how wide their column is. Everyone uses the same type of column. I think everyone usually uses the same stationary material in a given lab, but the length of your column probably is the thing you have the most control over as an experimentalist. Um, just to uh, give you a couple thought experiments, instead of doing this kind of together and talking about it, um, I'll just skip over this, but this is something we can talk about later. Um, in the interest of time, we'll go over, we'll skip this exercise for now, but think about how some of these different uh, packing column situations might change what the chromatogram for three example peptides look like. You have an early eluter, a middle eluter, and a late eluter. Maybe just kind of think about what this might look like, what you would expect it to look like, given these four different columns. But we'll come back to that later in the interest of time. So components of an LCMS method. Um, I'm showing you a different thing now. This is not a chromatogram, which is good because it's a terrible looking chromatogram if it were. I'm still showing you time on the x-axis, but now I'm showing you the percent B, the percent uh, organic, the percent, does anyone call it anything else, solvent B? organic. I think that pretty much covers everything for a reverse phase. Um, so there's a couple things, a couple components uh, in this, this figure that I want to point out. One is the starting condition, which is whatever this value of B is at the start of your gradient. Second thing is the duration of separation. So that's this piece here. And then finally, um, the start and end of the B. The most important part, I think, typically, is that separation. This is when you're actually going to be separating your peptides out, um, the peptides that you typically want to measure. But two other very important things here are that wash, which is the super high bump. Um, this is creatively called the wash because it's washing your column. Um, and then the wash drops back down to a lower, a lower organic, um, and that's the re-equilibration to get your column ready for the next run. Um, I, in my encounters with talking to people about their methods, I have not actually found a lot of people who realized how important the wash was. I talk to a lot of uh, researchers that tell me how bad uh, a problem carryover is for them. And when I ask them, well, what's your wash look like? They don't know. Um, so if you have carryover issues, my number one advice would be just Lengthen your wash, and you might see a lot of that go away. Um, so important conclusions for this part so far, if everything was a little bit too much detail, as long as you kind of have these slides in your mind, then you're golden. So this, this magic triangle of things to balance, um, and then the components to an LC method, the three column details, and then the three gradient details. Um, if specifics kind of went past you a little fast, that's not a problem as long as you kind of have an idea for these, these uh, conclusions from this slide. So another thought experiment um, that I'll leave with you to do either as homework or as a, a fun icebreaker with your classmates. Um, let's imagine these are uh, seven different gradients. All of these gradients have the same wash. All of these gradients have the same equilibration. What's the only component changing with these gradients? Yeah, the separation. So the separation, the start B at the beginning of the separation gradient, the starting B is a little different, and the ending B is a little different. So we have steep gradients and shallow gradients here. None of these is right and none of these is wrong because it totally depends on what kind of experiment you're doing. Um, I've seen lately uh, some uh, work that's looking at like histone tail modifications, and I notice a lot of those use very shallow gradients, um, which was interesting to me. Um, I've also seen 
uh, some uh, phosphoproteomic gradients that are extremely steep because phosphoprotein, uh, phosphopeptides tend to be a little bit longer and a little bit more hydrophobic than a canonical triptych, de uh, triptych digestion peptide. Um, so it's totally dependent on your experimental needs. Um, and it is probably the easiest thing you can change about your gradient to improve your data quality. We have data for this um, that we'll do kind of exploring together and hands-on uh, in a little bit, but you kind of think now, what would I expect if I did the exact same sample on these seven different gradients? Would the peaks be broader? Would the peaks be shorter? Would the peaks be taller? Would they be narrower? Everything I've shown you so far is just a linear gradient, but you can get pretty crazy with these. Um, if you want to get like major brownie points with your PI or something, you could get pretty uh, intense and do multi-step separations. So maybe you have a mix of very hydrophilic peptides and very hydrophobic peptides, and you want to capture both of them in the same method, this might be a good way to do that, employing a uh, multi-step separation. This is another part um, that originally would have been maybe an exercise to do together, but uh, for now I'll make it homework for you. But the wash and the equilibration lengths, um, there's general rules of thumbs that you can use based on your column details. Uh, so not everyone in the same lab should be using the same wash and the same re-equilibration unless you're using the exact same type of column and the exact same length. Um, but because a column is just a cylinder, you can calculate how much volume you need to fill that cylinder. And then typically, there's uh, a 70 to 98, a very high percent organic that you would use for your, for your wash, and do one column volume worth for your wash Maybe if you're doing uh, phosphopeptides or something more hydrophobic, um, you would need to lengthen that wash. If you have some sort of sticky peptide situation or sticky matrix, a uh, longer wash um, would prevent carryover. Then the re-equilibration is typically two to three column volumes after that. Um, so I have like little exercises that you can do in here if you want to practice. Um, but in the interest of time, uh, we'll go straight to some of the tips and tricks. I did see in your surveys that some of you are already doing LCMS, so if you have your own tips and tricks, I love compiling them from students because it makes me look smart when I go back and I have like, oh, what if we just did this? And then I can tell everyone that this student had this great idea. So one tip is I just told you two to three column lengths to uh, re-equilibrate, two or three column volumes to re-equilibrate. One tip is that you can increase the flow rate another parameter for your liquid chromatography method. So if you're kind of pressed for time and you want to increase your sample uh, throughput, you can increase your flow rate to re-equilibrate faster. Just be careful of the back pressure. Dead volume um, might be something that you've noticed in your samples. I started my gradient, but I'm not, in, not seeing any peptides elute yet. Um, there's some resources from the University of Washington that can help you uh, improve this. The third is the use of a trap or a pre-column. I had never done these before, before um, I had joined Mike's lab, but they love the, the idea of the trap, the pre-column. Um, it's just a really short column that doesn't separate the peptides, it just concentrates them. And you can kind of wash a little bit of salt away if you have very salty samples. Um, it, presumably, in theory, it helps because the trap will get dirty before your column gets dirty. If you're shooting things like plasma or, or serum that are maybe not the, the cleanest samples, um, changing your trap is better than changing your column. Um, I personally run pretty clean samples because I'm doing yeast lysates, so I don't see these gains. Um, but other people have told me that it works great for their plasma. Does anybody else have any maybe non-canonical things that they're doing with their LC? Oh, they have? Yes. Interesting. So, in all the nano LCs, you have this trap box. And they're for all the chemical samples because Yep, the, they tend to be dirtier, yeah. They're very costly. Yeah, yeah. Trap colors do go bad. Yeah. How often do you end up changing your so trap? It depends on users and samples. But, you know, sure. Like, there's any kind of, you know, LCs or something, impurities in the sample. At least, it is going to protect. The sure, sample. sure. And yeah. Yeah. So, so serious, big kid can't. Big kid samples sound like they uh, benefit more from maybe my more academic ivory tower samples. 
Um, so I wanted to talk briefly about scheduled and unscheduled methods. Sue had mentioned this word before, and I just wanted to make sure that everyone kind of knew what it meant. So we're going to imagine again uh, we had some chromatograms. So this is, again, time, retention time on the x-axis and intensity on the y. I'm showing the chromatogram, so this peak shape. I'm keeping these vertical uh, lines that are the individual scans, and I'm showing in each point where the actual scan was, but I'm drawing in different colors what the underlying ground truth peak looked like. Um, so remember the time in between each of these scans. If I uh, make one scan and then I go through all the other things that I was measuring and I may finally get back to that, that same analyte, that's the cycle time. Um, and let's say we're on a triple quad where we have to say exactly what we want to measure and when we want to measure it. This cycle time, I'm wasting all of my cycle time here because I'm waiting to collect this red peak and then I cycle through blue, green, and then red again, blue, green, and then red. I know my red peak is not going to elute till the end of my gradient, so why the heck am I even bothering to measure it if I know it's not going to be there? So that's the difference between a, an unscheduled method and a scheduled method. It's more efficient use of your mass spectrometer time. Um, so now if I did this scheduled and I said, well, I know I shouldn't bother looking, I shouldn't bother measuring my green or my red peptides, I can just spend all of this time at the beginning of my gradient scanning for blue, and then all the time in the middle scanning for green, and then all the time um, at the end scanning for red. So it's a little hard to see on this projector, but you might see here, I only got two points across the blue peak because I was wasting all this time measuring green and red when it wasn't even there. I only got two points across my green peak, and I only got two points across my red peak because I was wasting all this time measuring things that weren't even there. When I scheduled the method, now I um, have, looks like, four to six points across the peak. So I just boosted my quantitative accuracy um, by just telling the instrument to look for peptides that were even going to be there. Um, so there's a little bit of pro and con between scheduled and unscheduled. Um, the biggest uh, con against scheduling is that uh, it requires more work. You can't just set it and forget it. With an untargeted method, you could just say, sure, just measure all of these things all the time. I don't care. Um, but the things that you gain by scheduling, um, you can make uh, measurements on more targets. So if you think back to that triangle, you can increase the number of targets. Um, and you also get more points across the peak than if you were unscheduled. So remember back to that little triangle that we had up there. When we're thinking about um, these scheduled methods, we've boosted the target list and we've boosted um, uh, our cycle time, points across the peak, right? So Sue told you a little bit about how you can pull in multiple data files that were kind of the same thing. So that's called a multiple injection. So if I wanted uh, the best of both words, I, worlds, I wanted to have my cake and eat it too. I could do an unscheduled method with less targets by splitting my target list up into multiple injections. So this is, let's go back to this, this hypothetical experiment where I had three peptides. And when I didn't have it scheduled, when I went blue, green, red, blue, green, red, blue, green, red, for the duration of the method, I didn't have enough points across the peak. Um, let's say for whatever reason I wasn't comfortable with scheduling or I just was lazy because I'm a grad student, um, both are true, um, I could say, okay, for injection one, do half of my list, injection two, do the other half of my list, and then when you're in Skyline, you can import all of those as a single method, so you can view all the results at the same time, even though they were acquired maybe four different sample injections. So quick conclusion again, that was another dump of information, but the biggest take home points were these parts of the uh, chromatography gradient, and then that there are lots of interesting things that we can do to meet our experimental needs, all coming back to how we can balance that triangle.
So that was a pretty quick dump of information. Um, there's tons more resources online. Um, we're going to go pretty quickly through how two methods calculate retention time. So just to bring you back and orient you again, um, this is that left-hand side of your skyline uh, pane. So this is that target list. So here's a whole bunch of peptides in my target list. Um, let's say I needed, I wanted to know what their retention times were. Remember, I started off by saying we can predict the mass to charge very well, but we can't predict retention time very well. One attempt to predict retention time is called SSR calc. You may have noticed this in your Skyline uh, uh, software window. SSR calc stands for Sequence Specific Retention Calculator. Um, so literally what this group did was they took it, each individual amino acid, calculated some index number, and then said if you add up all the amino acids in a peptide based on their, their retention coefficient, you sum all the retention coefficients for each of the peptides, you get an estimate of their retention time. And Skyline does this for you. This is in that retention time pane, and you can right click graph, regression, score to run. And then you'll get this kind of window that Sue was showing you earlier, where now on the x-axis I have the SSR calc score, and on the y is the, reten is the measured retention time. So if in a perfect world, all of these points would fall exactly on a line. They'd be correlated exactly. Sue was showing you, in the real world, doesn't really <laughs> work that way. Um, SSR calc is not perfect at predicting it. The, just the sequence of amino acids is not a perfect prediction of what its retention time will be. So just to orient you, this is kind of what that looks like in Skyline. If I were to open up a document that had a whole bunch of data, so all my chromatograms here, I could click on one of those points in the retention time calculator, and it will select that chromatogram show me just that peptide. So she would, Sue was showing you some of those earlier, and I just wanted to orient you to where that is. So like we were saying, this can look pretty terrible um, and not end up being quite so helpful because there are so many outliers and just the regression is just so bad, and maybe you already went through this and the peaks look okay to you. Um, that's normal. It's, it's okay if it's not a perfect regression because SSR calc is kind of you know, kind of like a hand wavy, uh, somewhere around here, the peptide might elude. A better way to do this is called indexed retention time, um, IRT. So the way this works is you would have some set of peptides that you know beforehand, and these peptides are going to act like anchors for your regression line. So these uh, uh, synthetic peptide anchors are shown in red in the figure uh, on the right. So if I anchor peptide one and I anchor peptide two and I'm always gonna measure them, I can say some peptide X elutes halfway between these two. And it will always elute halfway between those two. So now across all of your runs, you always know to look for peptide X somewhere between anchor one and anchor two. And this works really well. This works much better than SSR calc because you know something about the peptide retention times. Yes? How many anchors is it really um, Most people use 10-ish anchors. At the barest minimum, you could get away with two. Two points describes a line, but obviously more is better. Um, I see most people doing about 10. Um, so you can get to this view and flip between the two. You can flip in Skyline between an SSR calc view versus a retention, an index retention time view. And I think the biggest takeaway point I want you to get from this section is how much better index retention time is than SSR calc. The con is that you have to do extra work, right? You have to have these peptide standards for retention time, and you have to go through the labor of always measuring those same anchor points. Um, with a little extra work, you get a lot more out of your data. Um, we're going to be doing the tutorial for how to do this because I'm two minutes over and I'm very sorry because I know it's lunchtime. <laughs> this is the last slide. I just mentioned you have to have these anchor points, these anchor peptides for retention time. You can buy them. You can buy synthetic standards. There's like 
five companies now, I think, that'll make index retention time standards. You can talk to your colleagues if uh, they have favorites here. Um, if you're an academic lab, uh, you could also just use endogenous peptides if you know they're always going to be in your sample. Um, so things that I've tried using before are like keratin. All of my samples have my keratin and probably my dog's keratin. Um, albumin's another favorite one that people use peptides for, but you just always have to be sure that that peptide's going to be in the sample. So that was a lot, but hopefully the take-home messages are clear. Um, there's a ton more information about all of these topics if anyone interested you in particular, um, but that is it. When you come back, we'll be doing hands-on for retention time, ingredients, stuff like that. And I will be here if you have questions, but it's lunch.